All right, well, welcome back to the series of conversations that I've been hosting on COVID-19 and the implications for global development with a real focus on the global south. I'm Raj Kumar, President and Editor-in-Chief of DevX, and I'm joined by a friend, by a fantastic leader in this, in this work, uh, Raj Punjabi, who is the CEO of Last Mile Health. Uh, the name kind of says it all, Last Mile Health. You know, you work in places where often the health systems are weak. Um, and where people need support. And you're, you're originally from Liberia. Your organization works a lot there. Obviously, very well known for your work during the Ebola crisis just half a decade ago now. Um, and really wanted to get a chance to sit with you today, Raj, to talk about the, the situation in Africa specifically. Um, you know, our, our community here at DevEx, it, a lot of our members are in Africa. There's a lot of interest uh, in understanding how the situation there is evolving. So maybe we could just start, you know, you, you worked on Ebola. Um, what's your take on COVID-19? Like, what's your overarching take about how this is going in Africa, kind of your big picture view, and then we'll, we'll dive deeper. Well, well, Raj, thanks for having me, and, and thanks to DevX for, for um, the amazing coverage and focus, uh, especially on low- and middle-income countries during this crisis. Yeah, I, I, I was just in West Africa, in, in Liberia, about two and a half weeks ago, and was there um, uh, providing care and, and helping uh, support some of our uh, community health workers and nurses that we've been supporting in partnership with the Liberian Ministry of Health. Uh, you know, interestingly, that this national workforce of community health workers in largely in rural areas were, were established after the Ebola epidemic. And um, the first thing they're trained on is, is surveillance. Um, so is looking for the next epidemic, but they're also trained on ensuring the everyday epidemics, like uh, ensuring kids with malaria get the treatment they need are, are addressed. Um, so my um, take on, on, on coronavirus and COVID-19 starts really formed there. I, I kept wondering as I was meeting um, community health workers like Marty Asino, who, who um, you know, 26 years old, had dropped out of eighth grade, but was trained, hired and trained a few months ago to uh, provide a set of primary care services and look for epidemics, how she was going to deal with this crisis in her home community. And, uh, you know, at the moment, then two and a half weeks ago, it sounded, uh, uh, while we were preparing, it sounded theoretical. And then a week later, we had our first three confirmed cases. Now we have six. And of course, across the continent, uh, of Africa, um, we, we have data just in from from WHO and the Africa CDC that shows that um, uh, the the epidemic has has grown um, uh, to 5,400 cases confirmed cases. Uh, so those are the ones we know, but that's a 300% increase in just the last week, and, um, yeah. and and the numbers are going to probably keep growing in Liberia and in some of the other countries we're working in, like Ethiopia. You talked about testing, and obviously the, those results are based on the tests that exist. I mean, what's your impression? I mean, come from Liberia, what is the testing capability like now um, in in Liberia and West Africa, or even beyond, depending on what you're what you're aware of? We the, the the Ministry of Health was able to get the first few cases, which were imported cases, so they came from travelers returning to Liberia. They were able to get those tested. Uh, you know, one of the the important things that was done during Ebola was to invest in, in the National Public Health Institute of Liberia. It's kind of like our mini CDC, if you want, uh, Centers for Disease Control um, uh, mechanism there. And so, uh, you know, Mosika Fala, Dr. Fala there, who's um, leading that effort, was, uh, had led Ebola vaccine trials and uh, was on the front lines of the Ebola crisis. So we're fortunate we have his and others' leadership because they were able to get these three uh, cases tested. But um, a number of the countries, and, and Liberia seems like there are signs of this now, are shifting from imported cases being the source of their infections to having local transmission, meaning the, the infections are now spreading person to person within a country. And um, uh, so, so in those situations, uh, and President Sirleaf and I wrote about this a couple of weeks ago um, uh, in, an, in an editorial, President Sirleaf, of course, being our, our president during uh, the Ebola epidemic, that the, there, there's, we've got to rapidly scale up testing. And we're, 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 we are behind in Africa, not because we don't know that we need to do it, but we're behind because the testing kits are in, insufficient. Um, so just, just to put a, a, a number on it for you, um, the, the, the Africa CDC uh, talk, uh, has, has helped 
distribute is planning for the distribution of an additional 40,000 tests to countries that are in critical need. But there's a shortage, they report already, of, of uh, some of the viral transport media, the, the, the other components like swabs, extraction kits. Mm -hmm. uh, these are the uh, barriers to, to scaling up testing. And, and uh, the WHO tells us, Mike Ryan, my, my colleague and friend there, the, uh, who's been uh, side by side with Dr. Tedros at these press briefings that WHO has sure. been holding every day, says that if, if, for the, from the countries that have done testing well, uh, South South Korea, uh, for instance, um, the, the the metric everybody needs to aim for is to have ten negative tests for every one positive test. That's how you know whether you're testing enough. In other words, most of your most of your tests should be negative if you're doing enough testing, not positive as is the case right now in the United States, uh, where I'm calling in from, in Boston, where we're behind. Uh, and certainly that's not where we, um, uh, if, if that's where we're stuck, where we're not doing enough testing in, in Africa, we're not going to know uh, uh, where the epidemic is. Yeah, I mean, I should mention you're seeing this from a really unique vantage point. I mean, you've got, so I'm excited to talk to you, you've got the experience of Ebola, but you're also in Boston, you're an associate professor at the Harvard Medical School, you're a practicing physician. I, I don't know whether you're engaged in this uh, directly yourself. I'd love to hear more about what you're seeing there, but so you're seeing how this is unfolding. In, in, as a true pandemic in places like Massachusetts and starting to unfold in places like West Africa. Um, and the testing challenge, including testing media, has been a challenge here in the U.S. as is pr protective uh, gear. Um, you know, how do you, how do you think this is going to unfold as we, as we go forward in West Africa and the rest of the continent? I just don't hear much conversation at all um, yet in, about how the U.S. and other countries are going to be supporting those kinds of initiatives in the developing world. You know, it, it's um, and I'm 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 fortunate to be affiliated with Brigham and Women's Hospital here, one of the Harvard teaching hospitals, and and trained across town in Mass, Mass General Hospital, and these are sort of ground zero for the for the response here in Boston. A lot of my colleagues are are seeing patients. I'm on the backup list um, in the coming weeks, uh, and and have also. Uh, have been able to contrast some of the, the 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 both the response here and response in Africa. I think, look, um, the 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 two things we're really focused on right now are are staff and stuff. So so we need to make sure that providers are trained. Uh, we we need in the United States. There's a lot of focus on training physicians. Uh, to respond to this, uh, nurses, making sure people know how to don and doff their protective equipment, the gloves, the gowns and masks to, that they need to keep safe and keep serving their patients. There's an insufficient uh, focus on, on, on uh, the role of community members, uh, community health workers in particular, and in particular like, like Mardia, as I was just describing, who, are, who could be the eyes and ears of uh, the response here in the United States. Now, they may play different roles, but in other countries, and we know during Ebola they were critical. Uh, they've they've been a fundamental uh, part of effective epidemic response. In, in, in Ebola, for instance, in Liberia, when when we were hearing projections in, and you'll remember this in fall of 2014, that there could be as many as a million and a half cases, and that most of those people would die because the case fatality rate was so high. Um, at that point, if nothing more was done, right? That was the projection that was made. Well, in that moment when Ebola threatened to bring humanity to its knees, just as this epidemic is threatening to do that, uh, nurses and doctors found it absolutely vital to team up with members of the community who were able to go door to door with the right protective gear and protocols on to find the sick, to get them into care, to literally hunt down this virus and the, the Ebola uh, virus disease and help stop it in its tracks. So we, we just couldn't have stopped uh, with uh, the epidemic in Liberia without the some 10,000 community members around a country of just 5 million people to respond. So I think one is we've got a lot of work to do in ensuring that, that community-based providers here in the United States are given the right support. But I think if, if we're going to have any success uh, in this, we're going to have to engage outreach nurses with community health workers. On I mean, the this side is of one of the things I hear a lot about uh, in terms of, I'm hearing a lot of reasons why we should be pessimistic about how this pandemic is going to spread in Africa and the ability to respond to it. But one ray of hope is the idea that so many countries do have robust community health worker cadres who may be able, using the lessons of Ebola, 
to get out in front of this, educate communities, give them basic supplies and training around hand washing and social distancing, and really prepare people for the response in a way that you know we didn't quite get right at the beginning of Ebola as a lesson that was learned. We've been reporting about this at DevX. I, I'd just like to get your take on that issue. Is this, a, is this an advantage in a sense, the community health workers and are people taking advantage of it yet? I think they are a, a, a potential advantage and we're seeing countries start to um, either consider using them or actually start engaging them in, in, in the work. So a, a couple, there are three things one needs to do in responding to an epidemic uh, to oversimplify it. One is to prevent the transmission uh, of, the, of the virus. Uh, the second is to detect the virus amongst those amongst those it's infected. And the third, for those who've got, become sick from the virus and those who've been exposed to the virus is to respond. So this, this, this adage of prevent, detect, respond uh, are, 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 are critical to epidemic response. Uh, we just wrote a paper uh, for the British Medical Journal on, on Friday with uh, colleagues uh, from the Liberian Ministry of Health, but also colleagues from the community Health Impact Coalition, a, 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 a coalition of 16 organizations working across four continents on community health workers. And so we, we described how community health workers uh, could be involved in each of these three areas. In the area of prevention, for instance, in Liberia, uh, community health workers like Mardia are already uh, conducting infection prevention and control measures, uh, promoting social distancing, you know, a lot of the communities, as you know, uh, don't have access to uh, water and sanitation. So when you say wash your hands with soap and water for 20 seconds yep. or more, uh, they don't have soap or clean water. And so organizing hand hygiene stations, these buckets with uh, soap and water uh, being distributed, uh, those are the kinds of activities that uh, any resident of a community, 6th to 12th grade educated, could be trained, hired, to do within weeks, of course, paired with the rest of the healthcare system. They can also help detect COVID-19. So on prevention, we're seeing a lot of countries uh, engage these workers. You're seeing Uganda do it. You're seeing Liberia do it. You're seeing Malawi prepare to do it with its uh, uh, several thousand health surveillance agents, as they call community health workers there. Um, the, the next thing, though, is to detect uh, the, the infection, especially as we're already seeing transmission in Ethiopia, in Liberia, and in, you know, upwards of more than 45 countries across the mm -hmm. continent. Um, so two things are needed there. We, we've got to have um, symptom recognition. And the second thing we need to have is testing kits amongst those who have symptoms. Of course, the challenge with this particular virus is that a great majority of people won't even have symptoms. Uh, uh, and so uh, this only highlights further the need to bring testing as close to home as possible. The ideal scenario is you give the testing directly to uh, patients themselves and uh, someone will still need to perhaps interpret it. Uh, but, but as rapid tests become available, community health workers can play a role in being in really an active uh, community-based surveillance system uh, because they can go door to door and find sick, uh, sick patients the moment they get they get infected. And, and so fewer and, and countries- Just so I understand yeah, this, Roger, are yeah. you suggesting that we're going to get to the point where the community health worker themselves can take the test, you know, administer the swab, let's say, and then get results quickly right there, you know, with the family in the household? Is that kind of the vision you, you think is possible? It, 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 I, I think that's where we're going to need to be. Uh, one way or another, we're going to need to bring testing closer to home. In the United States, you may be able to mail that to people. Um, uh, uh, I still think community-based providers will be needed for interpretation on the phone, uh, yeah. perhaps, if not, because nurse, I mean, once, you start, once you start doing that much testing, having nurses staff hotlines will be insufficient in terms of numbers. Having health departments with staff hotlines, it just there'll be too many, too much volume. So you need a different cadre, a different workforce. In Africa, in countries like Liberia, Ethiopia, Malawi, Uganda, they do have these community health workers. And so they, the, the question now becomes, you, 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 in your question was, this, uh, you know, will they use the current form of testing to do it? Th that may be a little more challenging. Uh, the supply side is not there yet. So we, uh, so far, uh, you have uh, the gene expert cartridges, for instance, that Liberia is getting. Uh, this is a 
ma machinery provided by Cepheid that Global Fund has invested in. It's actually used to, to test for um, tuberculosis. Um, they've developed new cartridges that you can use to test for, uh, for COVID-19. Those cartridges are actually uh, required to be used on machines that are in hospitals or in health facilities, which are far from, so often far from where uh, communities and residents are. Um, there, what we're excited about is the potential for the antigen antibody rapid test. Uh, so these are, these are uh, you know, what's been described so far, though the sensitivity and specificity is being worked out, is that these can um, have sufficient uh, accuracy, I should say, um, that, that uh, and also can be, uh, you know, put into a backpack or into a pocket and brought and to a home. blood test? Would, it, would this would be blood, kind of a blood yeah. test, right? A finger prick kind of thing? Yeah, so, so, so um, that's right. So it's an antigen-based, uh, it, it'd have to look for, for the circulating uh, virus in the blood itself for an antigen and then look for the antibody against that. Um, and so that's very, so community health workers that have done malaria testing, for instance, through these rapid diagnostic tests, as in Liberia, you know, one fifth of all rapid diagnostic testing for malaria is done, in fact, by community health workers. That's inclusive of, uh, so one out of five children in the country who have suspected malaria are not tested in a hospital setting. They're actually tested right in their home uh, before they even get there, which means treatment can be administered earlier. So community health workers have experience with that. Now, one is the science needs to evolve. So we need the rapid test kits there. The second thing is production. We need to have sufficient amounts that are available both at the community level and the frontline clinic level. But the third thing that then needs to happen is we have to ensure that community health workers are safe when they are providing and supervised. So the best systems in the world like Ethiopia, Liberia, uh, and, and a few others have nurses supervising their community health workers. So they can ensure that if a patient does end up having a positive uh, test result, and let's say they're very sick, you're not going to keep that person at home. 80% uh, will be mild, uh, probably, in Africa as, as it has been elsewhere, if the epidemiology stands. Uh, and they can be uh, followed at home, monitored for, for worsening. But about 20% will need to be hospital, uh, hospitalized for oxygen therapy. You need a nurse, a clinician provider that make, help make that, that triage decision. So they need supervision, one. Second, and this is really critical, is the appropriate protective equipment. So uh, what we're deeply disturbed and concerned about is you're seeing um, uh, some countries uh, deploy these workers, uh, community health workers to do active case finding, to look for patients with symptoms with severe acute respiratory illnesses, but they're not even being provided masks uh, right. or face shields. And, and, and uh, you know, it's been, uh, this is the lowest class of health workers. It's the one that's been most under-recognized and undervalued, but it's absolutely unacceptable for us to not have protective equipment. We, we've also heard well, the other I, argument. And I would just point out, you know, in Liberia, I think it was one out of 10 healthcare workers died from Ebola during the, during the epidemic, right? And so if you don't protect your community healthcare workers at the start of this, and you end up with significant transmission within that cadre of healthcare workers, it's going to be that much harder for these countries to, to stand up and be ready when, when uh, COVID-19 gets bigger. That's right. I mean, a nurse or a community health worker without a mask is like a soldier without a helmet. You know, neither stands a chance against their enemy. And uh, the, the challenge is when you look at nurses and community health workers, um, you, you're talking also about a gender inequality that exists. A great 70% of frontline health workers are women, as we know, uh, around the world. And, and uh, you know, they are often in, uh, uh, you know, it's not, the physicians are at risk, for sure, uh, when we're on the front lines. But nurses are, and community health workers are spending the most contact time with patients who are ill. So those workers well, have yeah. to have the and, gear. And especially in the model you're talking about here, Raj, because, you know, in the U.S. and where, where you are, and certainly near where I am in Washington, D.C., the model that's being developed is this kind of drive-through testing because it allows you to do some of that social distancing, right? You can have fully protected, we've all seen the images of fully protected people in their PPE swabbing through the window. The community healthcare worker model you're describing, even if we get to the level of advancement you wanna see, that's gonna be going door to door, presumably, a lot more social contact. So are you imagining that, that community healthcare workers will be in full PPE, like sort of what we saw during Ebola? Is that where, where this is gonna go? Or is it 
makeshift face shields and, and masks. What are you what are you calling on for for health ministers to actually do when it comes to protecting CHWs? Yeah, well, well, the you know the infection control science around this is evolving even in hospitals. I mean, you know, just at Brigham and Women's Hospital, we went from two weeks ago it was you had to wear um, uh, 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 a lot of PPE, full PPE, and N95 mask. Uh, and that was only important for the, the clinical providers. And now there's a universal mask policy, uh, at least a surgical mask for any provider. And then the clinical, any, any staff member, even facility staff that are not. So the science is evolving, but what we're in, in, in each country will make its plan. But in Liberia, what's being looked at is the idea of having the community health workers wear surgical masks with a face shield. Uh, and then uh, uh, have a protocol to, to be able to stand apart by six feet. Um, for for the workers to maintain that so distance. surgical masks, not an N95. That's right. And I guess that I guess that means the surgical masks are less expensive, more ubiquitous. We could possibly get the kind of supplies required. Is that what you're seeing at this point? We could, we could, but I think if there's one message from our conversation here is that we are um, we are woefully behind in terms of the, the shortage of, of protective equipment for any health worker in Africa. Just if you look at low and middle income, low and middle income countries as a whole, uh, the World Health Organization estimates that um, some 89 million masks and some 76 million gloves are needed in the coming months to respond to this. Um, so far, however, the, the WHO has been able to dispatch about half a million PPE sets. Um, UNICEF has dispatched about 4.3 million gloves, and uh, you know philanthropist Jack Ma has donated 100,000 masks. Uh, all of these are important contributions, but just even qu quantified against that demand of 89 million masks and 76 million gloves, uh, it, it, we're woefully behind. Now, our our argument is that governments want to, and we as a development community should be helping them to forecast PPE masks and gloves, for instance, for all health workers. Community health workers are part of the essential health workforce. And uh, I, these, these quantifications I just gave you are not including community health workers in most cases. So wow. um, we're gonna, I know one of the arguments we get is, well, we've got to prioritize masks for uh, where the disease is in ICUs and hospitals. I agree with that. The, as the as the as the production increases, I think in the next few few weeks we might find a place. As we've seen in China, you have Jack Ma now donating uh, uh, masks to Africa. Uh, as the epidemic waves go from one part of the world to another, we should have a situation where surplus is created and then be able to be redistributed. So if we don't ask and demand for community health workers to have it now. By the time that surplus is available, it will still only go into the hands of, of nurses, doctors, and hospitals and clinics. And that will be devastating on two accounts. One is the epidemic will be harder to control because, again, I said we can't, we, WHO has told us, 10 negative tests for one positive test. We can't get that level of testing with, in, in, in places with health worker shortages without having community-based health workers. But the second issue is that if you don't provide community health workers the right protective equipment, uh, we're going to have a repeat of the nightmare that we had during Ebola, where people are dying from non-epidemic causes, non-COVID causes, at a much higher rate than they are from the epidemic itself. Because these yeah, workers, let's remind people about those numbers. Was it eleven thousand people that died during in West Africa during Ebola? What, what, what were the numbers of those who died from Ebola? And, and what happened to everyone else who had, you know, a heart condition or a car yeah. accident or anything else? I mean, it's striking. It's really striking, Raj. You know, so, so it was bad enough and painful that 11,000 of our people in Liberia, Guinea, and Sierra Leone, the neighboring countries, lost their lives from contracting Ebola. Another 28,000, a total of 28,000 people contracted Ebola. The remaining, remaining people survived it. But... That wasn't the end of the story. Uh, when th this has been documented in multiple studies, um, because community health workers and frontline health workers, nurses and clinics, were not given the infection prevention control the early in the epidemic, and protocols were not modified, as you have in the United States, telemedicine's being put for virtual consults for outpatients. If you have a 
uh, chest pain or high blood pressure, somebody will consult you, you know, and me over the phone or via video. We don't have that ability in, in Liberia and most of these countries. What you are going to be able to have is community health workers and nurses who can provide that care. Now, they're providing the great majority of malaria care, prenatal care, et cetera. Why does it matter uh, if, we, if, we, if we don't modify these protocols? In other words, keep them safe, the health workers, find a different way to provide care, perhaps not touching patients, perhaps ensuring that there's a triage unit for patients to go uh, to, uh, to if they have respiratory infections. If, if we don't do that, here's the data. In Ebola, when, because that didn't happen, uh, the, the increase in untreated malaria cases as a re result of Ebola was 140% in Liberia. There's 140% increase in untreated malaria cases. There was a 75% increase in maternal mortality across the three countries that were most affected. Um, and, uh, and, and, and there was a 50% reduction in access to primary health care. That's going to probably be worse with this epidemic, uh, given yeah. it's respiratory based, uh, if we don't get ahead of this and ensure the frontline primary care providers, nurses, community health workers are equipped, so they keep sustaining to the level possible the primary care that people depend on. Right, it's much more transmissible and you're likely to see, you know, people who come into the hospital with respiratory illness could, could spread it to many other patients, to many other healthcare workers. That's what happened in, in Northern Italy. And if that's the case, then nobody wants to go to a hospital. No one wants to go to a clinic. You know, I've heard, I've, I've spoken to a number of global health professionals with experience in Africa and they've said, you know, it's gonna play out differently there because if you have a respiratory illness already today, not COVID-19, just any respiratory illness, a lot of the health systems are too weak to provide the level of care you might expect to get in a more advanced health system. How do you think this actually starts to play out as you see larger numbers of people with significant respiratory problems who need access to oxygen or ventilators um, in countries that don't have significant ICU beds, significant access to ventilators or oxygen today? How does this actually start to play out in these somewhat weaker health systems in, in sub-Saharan Africa? Well, I, I think that is where the, 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 the devastation is potentially the highest. I think the case fatality rate right now is 3% uh, when you look at the cases in Africa. Um, of course, those are across a wide variety of health systems. South Africa's health system is much stronger than, say, Liberia's is when you come to I mean, where, where, where the deaths happening. They're happening amongst the sickest patients, this, this group of patients that's going to need hospital care. They're going to need uh, supportive care right now um, with, with oxygen therapy for any patient that's admitted. I mean, that's the criteria for admission is going to be uh, uh, is, is whether they need supplementary oxygen. Most of the clinics, hospitals uh, uh, that, that we have in, in, in Liberia and in many parts of the continent don't have oxygen therapy. I, I remember as a medical student returning to Liberia after fleeing the war as a child, the first patient I lost uh, in my hands was a seven day old with pneumonia, treatable, but she needed antibiotics for her pneumonia plus oxygen to help her get through it until the antibiotics worked. But the health center had, didn't have an oxygen tank. We had to take the oxygen tank from the, um, uh, from, from the emergency obstetric facility for uh, women needing C-sections and borrow that for this little girl. 12 hours later, uh, there was a mother who needed to deliver a baby, uh, a C-section. They had to take the oxygen tank bank back. So this, this sort of horrible position had to ration the oxygen supply, right? Um, which is just a given in every hospital in the United States. That's, uh, things have gotten somewhat better than that moment 15 years ago, but they haven't gotten uh, much better uh, uh, to where we need to be. So one of the things Last Mile Health is doing, and I think other nonprofit partners uh, can do, is to ensure, look, you, you might fight by focusing on your core competencies. Ours is community health workers and nurses. That's what we do, that's what we think about every day. But we may have access to other resources that we could supply to partners. So uh, we're working with Direct Relief, uh, the, the wonderful organization that's been providing uh, protective equipment and oxygen concentrators abroad. And they've, they've committed to, to provide uh, about 100 oxygenators uh, oxygen concentrators, I should say. These are things that can sap uh, uh, from room air and convert into uh, concentrated oxygen that are vital in Liberia. So, you know, we, we don't staff hospitals in Liberia, but we're going to make sure in the shipment we bring with them to Liberia 
with gloves and gowns and masks for frontline providers that those oxygen concentrators get to Africa and, and get, to, get to Liberia's uh, hospital system. So I think that's gonna be critical in the short term. Uh, but look, um, Raj, if, if, I hope what we won't say is that um, there's a different standard of care that's needed for uh, those of us who've, who, who have friends, family, loved ones, or live in Africa. Um, I think that would be devastating. Uh, you look at our friends at Partners in Health uh, in Haiti, um, they're already with the first cases of, of, of COVID-19 there, uh, are providing ventilator support. They are trying to uh, provide ICU level care and, and any minister of health would tell you uh, uh, that they want that. They've wanted that for a long time. So we ought to use this opportunity uh, to respond to this crisis in a way that can build a long-term system um, for, for not just this pandemic, but look, this won't be the last one, I'm sorry to say. Um, and, and we know from Ebola that the best emergency system is actually an everyday system that can surge during a crisis. Let's make sure that everyday system also has ICUs and ventilators and oxygen supply because the next SARS type virus is gonna require it as well. So you, you talked about the conversation you're having with direct relief, the oxygen concentrators. I'm guessing you're on the phone a lot with some of the funding organizations, the foundations, the other potential partners out there. I'm just get, would love to get a sense from you of the sort of narrative, the tone, the urgency you know, we've seen some announcements, we've seen some development agencies come up and say, here's a dollar amount we're gonna contribute. Um, but it seems as though to me, nothing that would match the level of severity and urgency that you're describing. What, is, is there anything happening behind the scenes? Are you, are you, did you feel confident based on the discussions that you're having in the background or, or do you think we have a long way to go? How do you assess the, the we, moment in terms of yeah. funding and resources? We've, we're, we've got a long way to go. I mean, we're, we, um, you know, during the Ebola epidemic, and, and, and you know, one of the criticisms uh, on all of us, including Last Mile Health, was that we didn't act fast enough. Um, I don't know if that was the full story. The issue was we didn't act fast enough in an organized way. Uh, bec um, and, and what I mean by this is we, we need to have clarity on targets, first of all. What are the three targets that matter for anyone involved in this crisis. So, you know, Tom Frieden, a former CDC director who was involved in Ebola, has put out some very clear targets for people to consider. And I think WHO has also endorsed something similar, which is to say that you, you want to make sure, first of all, number one, on testing, that within 24 hours, you have 95% of the people who are infected tested and isolated or brought into care if they needed. That's metric number one. Ideally it's 100%, but 95% or more. The second important target is going to be 100% is to eliminate transmission. So, so that key metric is to ensure that 100% of the uh, new patients were previously on a contact list uh, of a health worker before. In other words, you don't want any one coming down with an infection that wasn't already known to be at risk for coming down with an infection. Um, and then the third target is, of course, to make sure that uh, those that are um, sickest are getting the, uh, you know, within a few hours, getting the oxygen therapy and ventilators they need. If those targets were more clarified and organized, and it took about eight months in the Ebola epidemic for that to be declared, that here are the three targets. There were similar targets made for Ebola. Now you can organize activities, work plans, budgets, and then you have a cost, you have a costed plan country by country, region by region. And now you can start figuring out what funding is put forward uh, and necessary. Now, let, let, me, let me pause there and see if you have a follow-up there, but I wanted, I wanted to make an additional point. Well, I do because, you know, I'm just thinking about the differences as you talk about this between Ebola and this situation. And the big difference in, in many ways was that Ebola exploded in West Africa. There were so many people suffering from it. Fear started to take hold in the West only when some cases made their way to the United States and elsewhere, right? And very few cases, there was almost no risk to the US at that point, but the fear exploded. And that's when people said, we've got to send in the military. We've got to get really serious about this. What's different here is 
the, the countries most affected today are mostly advanced economies. I mean, there are, there are exceptions, but mostly it's the advanced economies. Places like the United States are scrambling to get PPE and ventilators. And so the narrative about how do we invest in the weakest health systems in the world now seems to be lost in the shuffle. And I think we're going to come to regret that if that's the case, if we don't turn that around. And so that's kind of what I'm trying to get at for you. And what I'm hearing is that we, the conversation hasn't advanced far enough. You know, we're still maybe at the metric stage, which is not bad, but we're not at the resource stage. Is that, is that fair? Yeah, we, we, we're seeing resources. Um, so, so first of all, you're right. Coronavirus anywhere is a threat to people everywhere, right? And, and uh, Prime Minister Abi wrote a, an op-ed recently in, in the Financial Times about this. Um, and argued that um, you know it's not enough to just focus on this in rich countries. Um, there's going to be a W here. Uh, there's there's not a way to eradicate this as far as we know. No country's done it. They've they've been able to suppress the virus. Now the way they've done that is to shut down borders and to uh, and and to then uh, work on aggressive contact tracing, as I mentioned, aggressive testing, aggressive care for the people that get sick. Um, but how long are you going to keep your borders closed? Uh, uh, and and if, if there's a wave, uh, a, a spike in cases now, we, we get over this curve in the global north. The global south, including low and middle income countries, are, are, are now just two or three weeks behind where we are in, in, in the United States and Europe. Uh, we're going to see a, a rise exponentially there. Um, by the time America, Europe, Southeast Asia have their viral suppression achieved, let's say in the summer, that's the very time Africa is going to have peaks of cases. Um, you cannot keep your borders shut down for another 12 months because it's going to limit trade. It's going to depress economies that are already uh, trending or already are in recession. Um, so we, we do have to ensure that um, you know, the kind of act, uh, that while we take care of things at home uh, in, say, Boston, um, that we're also expressing solidarity with uh, countries in, in Africa. I, I think what Dr. Tedros um, uh, has done with the World Health Organization's COVID-19 Solidarity Response Fund is a good example of, of, of what could be put together. I think within the first few weeks, they were able to raise uh, tens of millions of dollars for this fund. But let's be clear, we don't need tens of millions. We don't need hundreds of millions. We need hundreds of billions or even trillions for the healthcare response. I think people may be getting messages mixed when they see the economic stimulus package that was just released here in the United States, $2 trillion worth of stimulus. Most of that funding is going towards the economic blow of the pandemic. The healthcare systems that need to be built uh, in places like Africa are not gonna access that kind of funding. They need it, but that's not where the funding is. So we need to have more support around the response fund, but we need to cost this um, and, and, and understand that the, the, um, the cost of inaction here, including in Africa, is much higher than the cost of action. Um, the cost of inaction is trillions. As It's not even a theory to say that. We used to say that during Ebola, it could be trillions. It is trillions. Um, it's tens of trillions, potentially. Um, so we, we ought to be investing uh, in, in a similar pandemic response anywhere this virus is. Um, I think that's critical. I had a conversation just like this yesterday with Mark Dybul, and he threw out a back of the envelope number of $30 billion. He said, look, it's not based on a lot of data and science, but, you know, in his experience running PEPFAR and Global Fund, you know, we, we got to get to that kind of number, which in some ways is not that big. It's, you know, the, it's, uh, it's sort of doubling U.S. annual foreign aid in a moment of global crisis, unprecedented in our lifetimes. You know, maybe the, the nearest example is 1918, as we keep throwing around this would not be such an amazing surge to just double U.S. foreign aid or to really increase official ODA from OECD countries by 25, 30%. Yet, I'm not hearing that conversation much. As you say, I'm hearing millions. I'm hearing much smaller announcements, including from private foundations, including from you know, multilateral banks and, and bilateral donors. You know, what's your message to that community, to the funding community? What should they be doing differently today? Because I can imagine them also saying, we're facing uncertainty. We don't know what the what our budget picture is going to look like. We're trying to continue to invest in the core areas of focus we have on many other development issues, on nutrition, on education. 
what, what would your message be to the, to the international organizations, foundations, and others that are funding in these areas? Well, I would say two things. I think, I think one is um, be strategic. Uh, you know, the, the, the virus has already taught us the faster you act, because what's happening in everyone's mind, I think, is we know this is important. We'll deal with our epidemic first, and then we'll get around to dealing with the epidemic in Africa. And the virus has already taught us, quite literally, within weeks. Uh, you know, again, I was in Liberia two and a half weeks ago, and now there's, they're moving from prevention to uh, containment to you know, uh, potentially transmission and mitigation. Every one of the phases of the epidemic costs exponentially more to respond to. So it would be much smarter. That there's a moral case, of course, that we should show solidarity. But there's a smart economic case to be made that if you act now, I'll give you an example. Um, uh, Liberia, Ethiopia, and Malawi, our team was running some back, back of the envelope numbers. If you were to put in uh, all of the measures uh, from social distancing to making sure health workers are protected to ensuring testing is happening to treatment, if you did all of that now, uh, up to 300,000 deaths could be averted from COVID by the end of this year, just in those three countries, right? Um, if you wait, that number is going to grow, the number of deaths uh, are, that, that will happen, um, then the cost to the healthcare system is going to be higher. The time it takes for you to then recover from that economically and from a health system perspective is going to be higher. So acting fast with no regrets, including in Africa, is possible. It's, there's no shortage of capital. I know there's a risk of capital going into recession and the market's going to recession, but there's not a shortage of capital now. Um, that's not the problem. Putting cash into the WHO's Global Solidarity Fund, ensuring that the nonprofits and the local governments involved in the crisis uh, are, are actually getting the resources they need uh, is something doable for us. The second thing I would say is to not forget, the, um, to, to, not forget to plan for recovery uh, for those most affected by the economic blow. Um, Ebola cost us $53 billion in social and economic losses in West Africa. Um, Liberia, uh, you know, planned a post-Ebola recovery, even starting during the crisis. Um, it's taken a lot longer to rebound from that than we thought. Uh, um, in, the, in the rich countries, you have these, you know, trillions of dollars of economic relief being passed to small businesses, to workers who will lose income during this pandemic. Low-income countries simply don't have the capacity to cushion that kind of economic blow. So one of the things uh, you know, we'd like to see is the UN and partners, much like they did with the UN mission on uh, Ebola, uh, to set up a similar type of body that uh, would help with the health system response in partnership with WHO, but then also plan the, a, a, a right-size Marshall Plan style econ economic recovery initiative uh, uh, to support uh, the people who've lost their jobs and income in the poorest countries. Yeah, we've got a piece out on DevX today talking about Mark Dybul's call for kind of a global task force. It sounds somewhat similar. I guess you're talking about it associated through the UN, but an official body like acting quickly, getting together the world's leaders and experts who can address the crisis in Africa. You know, I want to say early. It's not really early. It's, it's maybe past time in a way, but but, but getting there, it, I'm sensitive about time and I, I wanna get a couple of more, more thoughts from you, Raj. You know, you run uh, an international NGO uh, with you know, local presence in, in a number of countries, but you're, you're raising funds internationally. Just put on that hat for a second. What is it like to try to manage an international workforce, fundraising, you know, running an organization at this moment? G give us your take on that. Well, um, thank you. On the one hand, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's challenging because, um, you know, I couldn't be prouder of, of our team, you know, folks who are procuring uh, protective gear for health workers, folks who are, um, you know, had to be on self-quarantine as they re returned to Africa because we were in a leadership retreat when the, when the cases were, were starting to skyrocket. And, and, and so, I, you know, we've had parts of our team like Marion Suba and, and so uh, Chitule, Chitule in, Mal in Liberia and in Malawi, uh, working from home in quarantine in self-isolation uh, while trying to coordinate this response. Um, so, so that part's challenging. Um, uh, and, and so is, you know, I've got three children who are 
uh, young children. Uh, my wife and I are trying to split parenting uh, for our kids. She's a psychologist. She has a flood of patients who are uh, struggling with the, the mental health aspects of this crisis. So that part's tough. Um, uh, on the other hand, you know, I um, do feel like there is, uh, I fundamentally believe that that we as human beings are not defined by the conditions we face, no matter how hopeless they seem, we're defined by how we respond to them. And, and I've already seen our philanthropic partners. Um, uh, I think a number of them have said, look, we're not gonna stop our funding to you. We're gonna keep our funding at the very least, even if the recession hits, we're gonna, uh, where possible, surge funding um, uh, to provide it. Now, none of us know if that's gonna be enough and we still have a good few million dollars to raise ourselves to make sure we're adding to the services and, and could use all the help as others can uh, to do the work. Um, but I, I do have faith that, 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 that um, people will act in this moment. And, and um, you know, I, I hope that um, if we do this right, we'll make the systems, the underlying systems stronger for the next pandemic. And, and, and that's happened somewhat in Liberia with Ebola. We've got to do it again here. Um, which I think will be less expensive for all of us. Let me say one last thing. You know, some of our philanthropic partners have the very challenging um, uh, set of decisions where, where they're, you know, they might be in the United States or in Europe, and they're seeing their own communities that they live in, their own relatives, their own community members uh, being, you know, uh, assailed by this by this epidemic. So I, I it's not it wouldn't be anything but human to feel like, oh, should I do something here at home in a place like Massachusetts? Or should I try to help somewhere else? And, and I think what my advice is, is to focus on the method, you know, um, be agnostic to uh, the border because this virus does not respect city borders, state borders, country borders, but it will respect a method. If you fund testing, uh, go aggressive on it and go large on it. If you fund community-based health workers, go aggressive. If you fund hospitals, go aggressive. If you just focus on the method, that will actually uh, alleviate a little bit of this burden we all feel of, do we fund home or do we fund somewhere else in the world? Help me think through, because I'm sure you, like so many other leaders I'm talking to and, and, and executives who run organizations are thinking through the timeline. And you've got the experience of Ebola. Of course, a lot of uncertainty about how this pandemic is due. How is it going to evolve? But give us a sense of how you're thinking about the potential timeline. You talked a little bit about seeing cases surge in, in sub-Saharan Africa, perhaps in the summer while we've plateaued or got a bit under control, the infection uh, in the West. And then are you suggesting, because you talked about the W effect, that it's going to come back potentially here in the fall in the U.S. and in Europe? What happens then in Sub-Saharan Africa and other LMICs? Kind of take us through your thinking yeah. on, on how this might progress. I'm not asking you to predict the future, but what's yeah. the framework you're using? There are people who get paid bigger bucks than me to do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, here's one possible scenario. Um, well, first of all, the cases in Africa are doubling every three to four days. So we're already on that trajectory um, of logarithmic exponential growth. So, you know, if, if trends continue, we're talking about, um, by next week, we're talking about 20 to 25,000 cases by the in Africa. By the following week, there could be as many as 100,000 cases. And by the following week after that, we could be looking at about 400,000 cases. And you can just see it continue and expand. Um, so, so I think it's not in the summer. I think it's probably about in the next two to four weeks. Where, where you're going to see the wave come in, uh, in, in Africa and in some of these other places. Now, once you cross the curve, once you hit the peak in the U.S. and in Europe, um, what is likely to happen, because by definition, it is an epidemic and an, and an outbreak, and, and it's an epidemic of multiple smaller outbreaks, right? It, and each of the outbreaks starts and has to stop uh, as long as if efforts are made you're gonna see um, probably what's happened in South Korea for the countries who do it well. Um, and the United States is still catching up with that, uh, that approach. But if you do aggressive testing, again, tw within 24 hours, 100% of your people are tested uh, that, are, that are symptomatic and you're aggressively widespread, widespread community testing for asymptomatics. If you're making sure 100% of your new infections were previously on a contact list. And if you ensure that 100% uh, uh, you know, of those who fall sick uh, get the care they need, 
If you do that, then you probably end up where South Korea is, which is you now are in a viral suppression mode where you have taken the cases, um, uh, the South Korean foreign minister was describing this on a call I was on last week um, with the World Economic Forum. And she said, you know, we were at a thousand cases a day at our peak. We're down to about a hundred cases or less now. That's a manageable level for um, public health officials to do contact tracing to stop those epidemics. So those become mini outbreaks that you then stop. It allows you to start returning to some sort of normal business in society. The question, what's going to then get us to the next place in the, I think the same thing could happen in Africa. I don't think that would change as long as we're doing the same measures. The, the, the thing that's going to change this epidemic, a lot has been made around the vaccine. Uh, and people have then said, well, the, the flip of that is it's, it's 18 months away. And that, that really worries all of us. Um, the vaccine will be a game changer. But I think another game changer in the short term could be a, a treatment that works um, that either decreases the case fatality rate sufficiently that, um, that, that the, the sickest patients, as long as they're found early, will get better care and survive. And therefore, the risk of death, especially for the most vulnerable, like th those over 65, become less, uh, less high stakes, I should say. And the second aspect, as we've seen in HIV disease, for instance, and with other pandemics like HIV, is that sometimes the viral treatment helps decrease transmission. The viral treatment can help decrease transmission. So there are some trials ongoing right now for post-exposure prophylaxis. In other words, people who've been exposed get a treatment and it might prevent them from getting in the infection. Those are closer. Those are probably two to three, four months away. If we can get those uh, trials done, prove which one of these treatments work or which hopefully several of them, then our only challenge is making sure there's a healthcare worker within reach of everyone everywhere that needs that is at risk to get the treatment. If we can do that, um, uh, then I think we'll have a better chance at, 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 at getting faster towards not only suppression, but possibly, um, uh, you know, at least keeping this to a place where it's seasonal, if not eradication. I, I think people probably would laugh at the idea of eradication at this moment, but um, it's not been impossible to do with smallpox and other uh, pandemics. Yeah, and it sounds like just trying to you know read read through what you're saying that we could be talking at least several months. Like we're talking through the fall, you know, at least several months, probably into next year. Even if we have some better treatments, even if we have some prophylaxis, it, it's and, and especially when you think about rollout in many of the places we're talking about, that's going to take some time. The um, delivery, the delivery, everything we're doing to prevent, do prevention and surveillance and contact tracing and social distancing ought to be the same ought to help us build the delivery architecture uh, to deliver the treatments and the vaccines that are that are bound to come eventually. And if we can do that, we'll lower the time from discovery to delivery, which I think is going to be the, the biggest issue for the most vulnerable in the world and where the health systems are the weakest, including in, in parts of Africa. Yeah, I think anybody listening to this who is maybe running development projects or programs across other issues, not necessarily working directly on COVID-19. I mean, this has a lot of implications for all of that work that takes place in Africa, um, because you're probably not going to be having international expatriate staff flying around for quite a long time. You're probably going to have to rely much more on local professionals, much more on connectivity. It's going to become a much higher priority to get really strong internet connectivity and software platforms to work with, with your teams. Um, you know, this is this may may be a shift toward that new normal. I, I do want to ask you one last thought on. You mentioned a number of countries, and we're talking about Africa as a whole here, which is obviously a very diverse continent. Um, are there any places in particular you would zone in on if you were talking to Ted Dr. Tedros right now? Uh, or, you know, you're talking to other leading health and officials or donors. Are there countries or locations that regions that you think, boy, we are we are not where we need to be, and we need to to zone in there in particular. Um. I would say that every major metropolitan area, uh, uh, every major city, every capital city, and every major metro um, in every country on the continent needs to um, uh, uh, stand up not only the social distancing measures, which you're seeing, you know, president, I mean, I think most of the uh, heads of state, um, including the president of Ghana, the prime minister of Ethiopia, our president, we in Liberia, um, have all been quite aggressive at, at ensuring very quickly, first case, um, you know, we've got social distancing in place. 
Um, I think you need to make sure that surveillance, uh, surveillance is there. Hi, uh, surveillance is there and testing is available. So hiring, training and equipping uh, the right number of workers, including community residents to be part of that team uh, is gonna be critical. I'll t and and, and I, you know, I'll tell you just even on your last point, we're leveraging a, a digital training platform through our community health academy that's trying to set up a global classroom for um, to rapidly create and disseminate content on COVID-19 to community and frontline health workers. But we're delivering that content through smartphones because we know for these many months, we can't bring 100 community health workers or 200 community health workers together in one setting to get trained. That's, that's not going to follow social distancing. We're going to create uh, chains of transmission of the virus. So we're going to have to do that through smartphones uh, and, 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 and digital delivery. So I, I just, that's going to be a lot easier to do if we work now to train that army of, of community residents rather than waiting uh, for t uh, moments when community transmission is, is so widespread. It's a great point because not only do we need PPE and ventilators and all the other equipment on the health side, but there's a big opportunity for companies that work in connectivity, the mobile companies, the satellite companies, the you know, handset makers to dive in now and try to fill some of the gaps. Uh, we had a conversation that today with a number of uh, government officials across three countries in Africa and Cameroon, Uganda, Ethiopia. And connectivity is still a big issue in much of the continent. And, and we need to address these things really quickly if we're going to be able to stand up the systems that will help us get through this not just repeat what happened in, in the Ebola crisis, actually get ahead of it, learn from that, right? We've got systems for paying people, including healthcare workers, much more efficiently than before digitally. If we can connect, if we can communicate on software, do diagnostics right at the patient site, boy, we could really address this in a different way than the last crisis. I, I, I believe so. And I, 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 you know, this is an epidemic, a pandemic's likely to stay with us, a virus for, for some time, you know, if it behaves like other um, like the f influenza pandemic in terms of its, you know, recurrence seasonally. I, I, you know, it, it's, it, it, the virus itself, as it has done, um, it's incredible that something with like, what is it, 30,000 bases uh, and RNA uh, of RNA can humble an entire human humanity, you know, um, but it, it has humbled us, I think. Uh, and it will continue to do that every time we don't act to build the everyday systems uh, that are needed um, uh, and, and to ensure we're, re we're uniting, you know, prevention approaches in epidemic response with the everyday care that people want um, uh, for, the, for their everyday epidemics like malaria, complications of sure. childbirth, et cetera. Well, look, I, I want to acknowledge the important work you're doing and particularly all these community health workers around the world that are at the front lines of this, as you say, sometimes without the personal protective equipment um, you know, we, we salute them, we need them, and uh, boy, that courageous work is going to be more and more important and more apparent as time goes on. So thank you for bringing those voices to this discussion. Uh, thank you for your leadership on this, Raj, and we're going to be coming to you more and more over time, and, and we at DevX are obviously covering this um, from many different angles all over the world, and so we appreciate you, uh, you, you bringing, up, bringing your own perspective and giving us that spotlight on Africa today. Thank you, Raj, and thanks for what you are, your whole team's doing at DevX. We're, we're all grateful for it. Thank you.